Now, it was Deborah Bailey who was really pushing me, prodding me, poking me to show this movie today. So I thought I'd ask her to come up and tell you why. <laughs> Just in not more than two minutes. Okay. Okay. You can use the mic if you want to. I need the mic. I <laughs> All right, I know that there was a lot of controversy about this film. Um, Pastor and I talked about it, and, and he agreed that it is one that we should show up here. I agree. In watching the movie, <laughs> and remember the context in which it was written. It was written uh, by William Young as a book to tell his children about uh, grace and forgiveness. It is not meant to be a textbook. So you shouldn't take it in that text. So just watch it, enjoy the symbolism, and I think it might change the way you think about things going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Appreciate that. Let us pray. Our God of glory and our God of grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for people who tried to explain things to their children, written that try to explain things to us that we might through their writings get to know you better through this picture may we be challenged to think of you maybe in a little different way than we ever have may you guide our thinking that it might be clear and biblically true help us always to seek to draw closer to you in Christ's name we pray amen grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ so I ask you as Deborah has indicated a little this movie will do is your God in a box? In other words, do you have God all figured out? Is God going to do certain things in certain ways? And I mean, you've just got it. You know, God's right there. You've got it. He's not going to work outside that box. But boy, in that box, he takes care of everything for you. I know certain pastors who think, well, gee, God only works on Sunday mornings during worship in baptism and the altar. And that's it. Outside of that, no. You know, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does God work in baptism? Yes. Let me say that again. Does God work in baptism? Yes. We better be good Lutherans and say yes quickly there. Come on, I'm, I'm tricking you. Does God work in the altar? Yes. Did you experience the forgiveness of sins this morning? Yes. Now that was an interesting word I used, wasn't it? Experience. We talk about knowledge. You know your sins are forgiven, but did you sense the presence of God experiencing it? Well, how do we justify or how do we think in terms of experiencing God sometimes? Well, there was one biblical character who thought he knew God inside and out. He thought he had everything set up. He had his God in the box. He knew exactly how his God worked. His God worked in the law. His God worked in the temple. His God worked in the sacrificial system. You brought your you brought your gifts to the altar and sacrificed them, and everything was going to be fine. And then something upset his world. There was a man on a cross that died named Jesus. And God's servant named Paul just didn't understand it. Actually, his name was Saul at the time. He had studied under the leading teacher of his day. He was, as he claimed, one who obeyed the law to the last point. And he had God right there in that box, and he was sure how God was going to work, and God was unhappy with all those who were talking that he was doing something else. And there we see him holding the coats as the first martyr of the church was sacrificed, Stephen. As those were Pharisees were casting stones at him because of what he said to them, there was Saul in hearty agreement, going, yes, we got to serve our God by killing these people who are preaching falsehood. And Paul went on and dragged men and women out of their houses and threw them in prison if they claimed the name of Jesus. And he even got letters, as you know, from the, from the high priest, from the high council to go to Damascus. Not a simple jersey, but journey, but a cross to Damascus. And it was there that something happened to Paul. His little box got flattened. He got flattened. Boy, knocked to the ground by a light from heaven. And God said, Paul, I'm not in your box. I am so much different from what you think I am. 
It's going to be easy, in my opinion, for you to look at this movie and say, well, gee, God's not like that. But maybe you can look at the movie and say, what if God is somewhat like that? No, it's not a textbook about God. And it's not the greatest theology in the world. No movie will ever depict God perfectly. Why? Well, we're an imperfect people trying to talk about a perfect being, so it's always going to be imperfect. But it gives you an interesting concept to think of how God might work with us. And looking at Paul, let's look at these verses from Ephesians. I've put them here a couple verses at a time in fairly big print so you can read them. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the scripture. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the God of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the work of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things, so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. That's a mouthful of words. And it's a mouthful of theology. But there's one word in those ten verses that is repeated three times. And it's a very interesting word. Did you catch it? Verse 3. That by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ. Verse 9 and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who creates all things. Mystery. Mystery. Paul had his God in a box. And when God broke out of that, Paul saw, saw how little he knew and how little he realized about God and he found God in mystery. Mystery here means what God has revealed to Paul in special revelation, that the Gentiles are to be brothers with the Jews in Christ for salvation. Paul never had that concept. You were either Jews or Gentiles. You were either accepted or rejected. Oh, can't we draw some of the same lines today? You're Christian or you're not Christian. You're accepted or rejected. But where's grace? And where's acceptance? And where's the mystery? So I challenge you this morning. Are you like Paul? Is your God in the box? What would happen if God would break out of that box? What would happen? Generally, for, for us evangelical conservative Lutherans, there are two areas, two areas which we kind of tend to avoid or, or we wonder about. First of all, usually classified as emotionalism. Emotionalism. Do you have any feelings? Have you felt your heart flutter in love with somebody at some time? Well, why shouldn't your heart flutter in love with God? Why shouldn't you be a little bit emotional? I've had the privilege in my life, maybe some of you also have, of attending uh, the missionary Baptist churches, typically African American churches. Boy, when those people worship, it can get loud. It can get rowdy. I've seen women dance jigs down the center of the aisle. Very appropriate in their worship style. Oh, oh, we Lutherans, we don't do that. No, 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 no. We, that's not right. What did David do? King David, as they brought the the, the, the seat of mercy, the tavern, the, the, the covenant, the ark, into Jerusalem, he danced before God. 
Have you ever thought about raising your hands and worship for God? No, 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 no. No, I'm going to sit on them, Pastor. I'm not going to raise them up. I would like saying, if your eyes are in someone else's hands, you're not on God. You know, it's not bad. Maybe to raise your hand at some time. If not in public, in private. Or have you ever gotten down on your knees and truly cried over your sinfulness? Your wickedness caused God to send Christ to the cross. That's the mystery. God doesn't rule by His law. He moves by His grace. Christ crucified, died for us. That's what we celebrate in the sacrament of the altar this morning. His body, His blood, broken, poured out for our forgiveness. Now, I'm not trying to change anybody this morning, but I'm trying to ask you to consider some of these things that maybe you haven't thought of before. There's emotionalism in the Bible. You think when Jesus raised somebody from the dead that people went, well, that's nice, Jesus. Yeah, that's nice. I'm glad my daughter's alive again. Thank you, Jesus. Now i got to feed her. Now, come on. Jarvis was jumping for joy and had to tell people when Christ said not to. So emotionalism. We need to feel emotions. We don't need to go overboard. But love and joy and peace are not only intellectual concepts. They're concepts that can move our emotions, can stir our hearts. And not only emotionalism, but how about mysticism? Have you ever thought of mysticism in terms with uh, Christianity? Here's a definition from Webster. Belief that union with or absorption in the deity or, at, or the absolute or the spiritual apprehension of knowledge inaccessible to the intellect may be attained through contemplation or self-surrender. Have you ever thought that God might meet you in some mystical way? No, God doesn't do that. What about Peter? Peter went up on a roof to pray, and what happened? All of a sudden, there was this sheep falling down in front of him, as he described it, with animals of every kind that were unclean. And God said, kill and eat. And Peter said, oh no, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. Nothing unclean's ever passed my lips. And they said, whatever God has called clean, don't call unclean. It happened three times, the vision. That God opened the door for Peter to go to Cornelius' house and preach the gospel. What happened on the day of Pentecost in Peter's sermon? Your young men shall see visions. Your young women will dream dreams. Can God talk to us in ways we don't know? Oh, that all happened in Bible times, Pastor. That doesn't happen today. Well, why not? Oh, we got God in our box. We got Him right here. We know what He's doing. Well, maybe. Maybe you should build a bigger box or maybe you should just forget the box at all. And maybe you'd see God a little bit more in your life if you let him out of the box and found out what he's doing around you. So I'm not suggesting that we should all go home and believe our dreams. I'm not suggesting we should all jump up and down with joy, although it may not hurt sometimes. The kids did it this week at PBS. But maybe you should say, if I got a God that's too small, and maybe my God is larger than I think, so if you get to stay around and watch the shack, or if you can watch it sometime on your own, maybe you'll think God's not like that. But maybe you'll think, maybe God can be like that. And maybe my God is a little too small in that box. And I need to let him out. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.